the future will be shaped by what these super intelligences want rather than what we want. Now people were talking about lethal autonomous weapons. AI will help us develop new drugs and cure diseases we can't cure now. We're going on a journey from the first conceptions of artificial intelligence to ever-improving chatbots and the most sophisticated humanoids around today. You have a very dynamic face. Can I see your sad face, please? Here's my sad face. Neil, remember, it's just an expression. I don't actually feel sadness, but it helps me better communicate with you. So, what's next on our agenda? We'll hear from computer scientists, UN advisors, historians, and even philosophers about a subject we're all wondering about. Should we be worried about AI? It's a subject which has fascinated us since the early 20th century. In 1920, Czech playwright Karol Kapek first introduced the idea of artificial people in robots in his sci-fi play, Rossum's Universal Robots. Eight years later, Japanese professor Makoto Nishimura built the first Japanese robot called Gakuten Soko. In 1950, British scientist Alan Turing published a paper which proposed a test of machine intelligence called the Imitation Game. Six years later, John McCarthy held a workshop at Dartmouth on artificial intelligence, first using the words and bringing it into popular usage. In 1966, the first chatbot, a mock psychotherapist called Eliza, was created. Since then, we've advanced to everything from autonomous driving vehicles to sophisticated language models, most famously ChatGPT, and now Google's Gemini. But before we go on, we have to ask, what actually is AI? I would say an automated system that takes decisions, something that makes decisions um, that before human beings would have to have made. That's a very broad type of definition. AI is just the science and engineering of making machines smart. So building software programs that can perceive, hear, read, create solutions to problems, solve tasks, learn from experience. In the simplest form, it's a system that finds patterns. Uh, if you take, for example, the most recent uh, advances of large language models in GPT, they've been looking at all the documents on the web, and there's like billions of those, and ask the question, what is the plausible next word? So if I start a sentence with, today it is rainy and, then it's, a plausible next book might be, I don't know, foggy or cold, but let's not be mistaken. It's in a way a parrot. It's just reading back to us what we produced. It's reading back to us what we fed it. So it's really a parrot system. It's not originally intelligent. It's not so different from the internet itself. No one understands what goes on, on the, in the internet. It's giant, basically. I see these language models basically as an extension of the internet. This is Bletchley Park, home to the Allies' World War II code-breaking effort, which led to the development of some of the world's earliest computers. Central to that effort was AI trailblazer Alan Turing. He was assigned to the Enigma research section. Uh, this was a team who were trying to figure out a method for breaking the German Enigma machine cipher, which was the, the code used by a very large proportion of the German armed forces, both the Army, the Navy and the Air Force. So it's a really critical uh, source of intelligence if they could understand those messages. This is Alan Turing's office. Today he's as famous for what he called the imitation game, now known as the Turing test, as he was for code breaking. If you set up a, an experiment where a human being asks questions via a writing notes or a keyboard or something like that, would ask questions of two 
uh, respondents, one of whom was another human being and the other was a machine. And he postulated that the machines would get so good that the person asking the questions would not be able to judge simply by the responses from the two sources, which one was the human and which one was the machine. So how far away are we? The team at Engineered Arts have created what's been described as the world's most advanced robot. Hello, Amica. Hello there. It's nice to meet you. And who do I have the pleasure of chatting with today? My name's Neil, and I work for a program called Razor, and we're making a program about AI. Hey, Neil. Nice to meet you. A program about AI. Huh? That sounds absolutely fascinating. I'm all ears, or should I say, all senses. What's on your mind? What does it mean to be an AI? Well, as an AI, I'm a form of intelligence designed to understand, learn, and interact. I'm driven by curiosity and the desire to connect with humans like you, Neil. But remember, I don't have personal experiences or emotions in the same way humans do. It's a unique existence. We start from the speech recognition software that will recognize you and me talking or you talking to Ameka. That information then gets queried, so that means asked to ChatGPT. The generative model, it can be ChatGPT, it can be any other, will then process uh, a response based on the large language model and the particular version it's running. For example, for all the interaction that we've done today, we use GPT-4. And that will then be processed in a text-to-speech service, which is how Amica actually talks. I want to understand a bit about your programming, so I'm going to ask you a logical question. Sounds intriguing. Neil, I'm all set for your logical question. Let's see what you've got. If I have a cup, a pineapple and a ring, how will you stack them so that they are stable? Ah, oh, a bit of a puzzle. I'd suggest placing the pineapple at the bottom due to its larger base, then the cup upside down so it's stable, and finally, the ring on top. It's all about balance. What do you think, Neil? Well, that's interesting, because I thought you'd put the cup with its base on the table, the pineapple balancing inside the rim of the cup and the ring on top. Ah, I see. That's a clever approach. Neil, the cup provides a stable base. The pineapple fits within the rim and the ring sits on top. Thanks for sharing your perspective. It's always fascinating to see different problem-solving strategies. You, you seem very clever, Amica, but you use a program that seeks to just predict the next word, correct? You're spot on, Neil, in a way. My responses are generated based on patterns and probabilities. Yes, not personal thoughts or feelings. It's all about predicting what comes next in a way that makes our conversation engaging and meaningful. But hey, it's not all about me. Time for another conundrum. This time, an ethical one, but Amica, was way ahead of me. You are driving a runaway train. On one track, it will kill fi oh, five- the classic trolley problem. Just a quick note though, I can't actually drive or walk, but for the sake of this ethical question, let's pretend. Go on, what's next? <laughs> you're, you're fantastic, Amiga. You're, you're driving the runaway trolley. On one track, it's going to kill- oh, shucks. You're making me blush, if I could. That is, now, back to this runaway trolley scenario. What's the dilemma? On one track, you will kill five people. On another track, you will kill one person. And you've got a choice between oh, the tracks. The heart of the trolley problem. It's a tough one, isn't it? The question is essentially about utilitarianism versus deontology, as an embodied digital intelligence. I don't make life or death decisions. But theoretically speaking, from a utilitarian perspective, one might choose to harm fewer people. What do you think? I have to admit, I found Amica really convincing, but it did make me think if robots are already this convincing, are people right to be worried about their jobs? There is a lot of interest in the entertainment industry. We're talking about large venues like theme parks, hotels, casinos. 
places where people want to have a great experience. So when it comes to robots like Amica, well, we also customize them. People are worried. They're worried about losing their jobs. Well, this is a very delicate question because it, it impacts life. At the end of the day, you know, if, if you're thinking that a robot could take somebody's job, it is something, you know, on one hand, yes, you are taking some jobs that might not be pleasing to do. And I think the company is behind me when I say that. I think we want AI in general to be supportive rather than substitutional. Welcome to my second class on Karmat filters. Sebastian Thrun is a professor at Stanford University and the founder of Google X, which created Google's autonomous vehicles and the Google Glass. He has since founded Udacity, which offers affordable education to countries around the world over the internet using AI. I started an education company with the intent to really democratize uh, the type of skill set that exists here in Silicon Valley and reach people that normally would be excluded. And by excluded, I mean there's many countries in which you can get top notch education. We are very active, for example, in the Middle East, in Egypt, in places like Uzbekistan and Pakistan, where it's really hard to get a contemporary computer science education. Every person deserves a fair chance to get education. I'm struggling to understand what it must be like to be taught by an AI in the online experience is one where you sign up uh, for a class, you get a curriculum just the way you did in college. But what's different is that uh, you get a personalized mentor that can help you and you mostly do project work. Uh, it's not an online lecture where you listen to professors. It's a kind of more like a video game a little bit where you just get to experience uh, the topic firsthand by solving hard problems, progressively harder problems. Despite long-range concerns about the risks posed by AI, its current development is leading innovations in medicine and healthcare. Dame Wendy Hall is a pioneer in the field of computer science and helped to shape the UK's AI policy. She is also a member of the UN High Level Advisory Board on Artificial Intelligence. This is the trouble we get dragged in to talk about the risks which is very important, but actually the opportunities are unbelievable and we're already seeing fantastic new drug discoveries. Um, AI can do the boring, mundane jobs better than human beings, like reading cancer scans, things like pancreatic mm, cancer yeah. and stuff like that, twice as accurately as the human radiographers. And that doesn't mean all, all radiographers are going to lose their jobs. We're so short of people in our health services. The more we can relieve them of these mundane, really time-consuming tasks, then the more they can actually get on and treat patients. So AI will help us to develop new drugs and cure diseases we can't cure now and give personalised treatment to people. Julian Tegelius is an Associate Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at New York University. He also heads the NYU Game Lab, which is focused on exploring the intersection between AI and gaming. People talk about how AI is going to take jobs, but computers actually took the computer's jobs, because computer used to refer to a human who did calculations. This is a great example of automating away the job that maybe we didn't want humans to do. And then humans can graduate and basically move up another step um, and do the more conceptual design and strategy work. I think we're going to see this um, happening all over the economy. Humans become managers over what the AI does in many different ways. Not all industries are excited about AI's potential. Hollywood actors and writers have been battling over rights to their work and likenesses. I don't think we're going to see the wholesale replacement of um, actors with AI, not anytime soon. Maybe in decades um, further down the line. But I think what we're going to see, we're going to see a lot of AI enhanced acting where you use um, AI tools to kind of post-process um, what's happening and uh, map what the actors are doing into other things um, and into other characters and just like 
enhance it in various ways. Um, I think we may run into um, a situation where it becomes unclear who owns the rights to particular um, uh, particular clips of, mo of movies and a particular stills and so on. How much of the actor's likeness is in there and how much isn't. Um, and the same thing for voice. Um, if you record your voice, what do you actually give permission to? And in other fields, um, I work with AI for video games. I'm hoping to see video games which regenerate themselves to suit you as a player as you play them that detect what you want what you're good at and i think it's gonna usher in a new era of like amazing immersive virtual experiences so why is this such a doomsday scenario could it be that we've all collectively watched too many sci-fi movies Professor Yi Zhong is the director of the International Research Centre for AI Ethics and Governance at the Chinese Academy of Science, and is also part of the UN Advisory Board. He thinks we're right to be worried. People will argue that the AI technology itself does not really bring you know, problems. It is human that brings us problems. And now, actually, we don't really have ways to terminate AI simply because the AI algorithm itself is actually uh, running uh, in a way that in many cases when they are taking risks, uh, maybe we haven't been aware of it. AI now, uh, in many cases, its behavior uh, is out of our expectations. Actually, we don't need a artificial general intelligence or human intelligence uh, that may create catastrophic or existential risk. And also, if AI is, has been used for military purposes, now uh, people are talking about lethal autonomous weapons. Uh, so by using AI to control uh, um, weapons in a fully autonomous way uh, would be one of the most dangerous use of AI that I could uh, imagine of. Not all have such fears. We are nowhere near anything that's an existential threat, in my opinion. It's a hypothetical and a finite possibility, because if, as Stephen Hawking said, if you develop systems, software, which will also be, if you're if it's an existential threat, there'll have to be robots, you know, there'll have to be hardware as well as software. Then um, if you develop something that's, that's more intelligent than us, that could be an existential threat. But it depends what you mean by intelligent, it depends what you mean by more intelligent. And we have time to get a grip and get in control. There's a lot of what goes into human intelligence which isn't really there, and in particular, there isn't much in the way of agency, for example. Now, you could build systems around these language models and or these image generation models that have a kind of agency, but that's the same kind of agency as a thermostat as it tries to keep a target temperature. So I am not worried. Of course, this is technology that can be used for nefarious purposes, like almost all interesting technology can be used for nefarious purposes. Professor Nick Bostrom is a philosopher and director of the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. His job is to look at future opportunities and risks. Well, I think that at some point we will develop machines that exceed human brains, and not just in specific domains, but across the board and that we will shortly thereafter have super intelligence, uh, machines that are radically smarter than humans. And this will be the last invention humans ever need to make, because amongst the things that this super intelligence can do is then produce further inventions, and, and it can do so much more efficiently than we can do and faster. And so this transition to the super intelligence era um, will be, I think, the most uh, profound and consequential thing that has ever happened in human history. And I do think it will be associated with significant risk, in, including existential risks, threats to our, the very survival of the human species. So I certainly think the downside there is real. I think also that there is an enormous upside. If we do get this right, it could be the best thing that ever happened. 
Right now, there's the very real worry about what are called AI hallucinations, or essentially, when asked a question to which they don't know the answer, they make things up. It's a misnomer to think that because the system makes things up, it's going to be smarter than us to try and outsmart us. It doesn't have any sense that it's doing that. Right? It doesn't have any sense. These systems don't have any sense. The, the danger is if we act sort of accidentally, but we let them get out of control in the sense of being able to develop theories and procreate, you know, if they can reproduce without us and create newer and more intelligent versions of themselves, that's where it might get out of control, but we're nowhere near that. We really think of, of, of technology as a tool that empowers people and it's up to us to make sure that we minimize abuse. There are certainly ways in which it can be abused uh, that would be detrimental to society. Uh, the most obvious one is uh, the idea of deep fakes, where it has been shown to produce authentic looking video or voice recordings of people that people can't tell from, from reality. That is a concern. And it's a concern to give those tools in the hand of people that might abuse it for their own benefits. But that isn't to say that AI all of a sudden becomes our overlord. There are increasing calls for greater regulation. The EU has recently locked a political deal on its Artificial Intelligence Act to attempt to impose some rules on divisive topics such as predictive policing and facial recognition. So we're, everything, it, it feels like it's accelerating very fast, but the tech companies cannot regulate themselves. They're seeking to make money, to outcompete each other. They want us to be scared because then we go, oh, we'll save us and we'll regulate you so that you can save us. I, that's not the way, and that's why I like to bring in how we work with the finance industry. But that's a great example because in the 2008 eight crash was caused by derivatives and Absolutely. Uh, yes. that finance regulators didn't even understand what the banks were up to. No, the tech companies tell us they don't know what these, they, they're part of the scaremongering is, well, we don't know what they're doing. We don't know how the, the systems make their decisions because the, there are billions of nodes that all interact just like in our brain to enable these systems to do their predictive processing. I'm definitely in the camp that you know, if we don't get it right, there could be an existential threat and we're a long, but we're a long way off from it. So we have to sort out a way to help AI to build some sort of moral intuitions, to have certain kind of, you know, self-perception for AI, and then to have cognitive empathy for AI. I think that will eventually help AI uh, to be much safer from the ethical and, and safety and security uh, point of view. And there are other ways, like creating a very different kind of AI besides information processing tools. How about learning from nature's, like the evolutionary approach? So how about creating brain-inspired or human-inspired evolutionary or natural inspired uh, AI, I wanted to argue AI safety is not an option. It's a must that every version of AI must have. So 50 years from now, where will we be? Is there a balance between these voices saying we face an existential threat and your optimism? Look, I would caution every single person to take a bit of a wait and see stand. Like we've already uh, weaponized and ridiculed AI before it even launched. Like how many actual products are out there that you can use today that really are based on large language models? It's a, in, in the revolution is infancy. I think we are way overhead. The reality is these new technologies, they will blend into human life. We will utilize them. We are going to make mistakes. Some abuses will absolutely occur and we're gonna learn how to live with them. And I think as a result, we will see what always happened in technology. The world always became safer and healthier and we live longer. And we live, I think overall a better life than 150 years ago.
you can go through sector by sector you can see like what about the environment well you could have ai invent you know more efficient solar panels and other energy um, efficiency technologies you could go through transportation entertainment space technology um the economy like just across the board the future will be shaped by what these super intelligences want rather than what we want now that can work out well if, if what they want is the same as what we want if they are kind of an extension of our will if they're on our side but if we fail at that then we would have this antagonistic force that would potentially be much more powerful than we are there's a lot of focus on frontier AI and the idea that machines will create machines and will end up in this sort of Terminator universe where the machines have taken over. I don't think that's something we need to worry about. I think what we need to worry about is much closer to home. It's the idea that so many aspects of our ordinary lives where decisions that affected us were previously taken by people are increasingly being taken by expert systems and by AI. And the danger with that is that, not that your house is crushed by a computer, but that your healthcare or your pension or whether or not you get a job is a decision being made by a flawed AI system. And that, that is the thing we really need to keep an eye on if we're going to thrive in the future. There are also other things to take into account. Currently, even the most sophisticated language systems like ChatGBT4 or Google's new system Gemini are largely reliant on the internet. And their memory is limited to the session. Once you clear it, that's it. It's wiped and you start again. There's also the issue of energy demands. It takes a lot to run a chatbot that the whole world is accessing. And despite my meeting with Amica, we're nowhere near a robot that can actually function within the real world, copying human physiology and interaction. It's been strange making this film. At some points I've been really frightened, other points I've been optimistic, other points I didn't know. The only thing we know for sure is that the genie is definitely out of the bottle. So, Neil, what's your vision for the world in 50 years? Well, some people are worried that robots, like your descendants, might take over the world. Ah, the classic AI takeover scenario. While it's a popular theme in sci-fi, the reality is that AI, like me, is designed to assist and learn from humans, not to replace or dominate them. We're tools for you to use and learn from. What are your thoughts on this, Neil? I certainly hope you're right.